I got your attention? I needed to because this video is longer than 30 minutes. And statistics show that if the speaker doesn't have your attention within the first 30 seconds, then your minds will automatically go into autopilot mode. You'll start thinking of things that you have to get done for the rest of the day instead of actually listening to the speaker. Now, all of us have heard of boring keynote speakers. My job is to make sure you're not one of them. Before I get started, I want to mention to you that we'll be focusing on two different kinds of speakers that you may want to be. A humorous leaning speaker and a heartfelt leaning speaker. In other words, a funny or serious speaker. Now, both types of speakers are extremely important and both of them have some differences but also have very overlapped structures about them. But no matter what type of speaker you think you are in any situation, the message to the audience is the most important thing. Now you might be thinking, well, I just want to give a content oriented presentation to my company, or I just need to not look bad in front of my professor at school. Just a simple presentation, simple speech. Well, here's the good news. All of the tips that I'm going to give you can be incorporated and tweaked to fit your exact needs. Now before we get started, I want you to do just a one simple exercise. I want you to write down in one sentence, yes, just one, of your end result of why you actually want to be a speaker or improve yourself as a speaker. Now I don't want an answer where it's like, oh, I just want to improve my confidence on stage or I just want to build up my posture on stage. I don't, want to, I don't want that answer. I want an answer where I want to build my self-esteem in front of my peers, or I want to get a promotion in my work, or I want all the professors to look at me as a confident person where they can just give an A. That's the kind of answer I'm looking for. I'll give you a structure just to show you. So right now, pause the video and write your end result. To get started, here are the table of contents that I'll be running through. Part one is creating instant icebreakers the second you get to the stage. You gotta get your audience engaged right from the start or else they'll go into autopilot mode. And you don't have to put on a bra, don't worry, okay? Part two is changing your thought process while speaking. Everything that you thought was a good speech or made a good speech will be reorganized in this section. Part three is writing a humorous leaning speech. Now, if you don't think that you're a funny person, then do not skip this section because a lot of important tips that I will be saying here can be incorporated in any kind of speech that you write. Part four is writing a heartfelt leaning speech. For heartfelt leaning speeches, how do you get the audience glued to your life stories? How do you get them so focused that they're not even going to look at their cell phone? That'll be gone over in this section. Part five is an advisable conclusion. Now, like I said, the message to the audience is the most important thing. So you tell what you've learned from your experience, tell the audience about it, and tell how to advise them from learning what you learned from it. Part six to nine, we start enhancing your speech. Part six is body language while you're on stage, moving around, where to move, how to do that, and your voice modulation. If you sound like this and it's boring, okay? Part seven is discovering your unique traits as a speaker and using them to your advantage on stage. Part eight is using word repetitions throughout your speech to help your audience remember your speech better, along with tips on humor, pauses, etc. Part nine is coming back to your first exercise that you just did in writing your end result, maybe editing it, in looking at it again. And part 10 is your certificate for passing this course. Let's get started. Unfortunately, a lot of speakers ignore instant icebreakers and simply rely on starting their speeches right away. Although this isn't a tragedy, it just isn't worth the risk. 
because it's like you go to the cinema or the movie theater and you're offered to a free upgrade to sit in a recliner seat rather than sitting in a regular seat. If you sit in the recliner seat, you're way more likely to have that amazing start to the movie and you're going to tell more people about your great experience. But if you sit in the regular seat, yes, you are seeing the same exact movie. However, you're not going to remember as well as the instant icebreaker of the recliner seat right from the start. So the same thing goes with the movie theater with the instant icebreaker. It's just better to have the instant icebreaker instead of having the risk of not having it and then their minds going into autopilot mode. You want them to remember your speech as much as possible. Like I said, if you don't have your audience's attention within the first 30 seconds of you speaking, their minds will go into autopilot mode and they'll hardly remember anything that you said during your speech, even if you took hours to prepare your actual speech. To get an idea of what I'm talking about, here are three of my favorite icebreakers that I've seen from different speakers, whether it is part of their actual speech or it's part of something going on at the event. Check it out. Ladies and gentlemen, here with a special edition of the Colbert Report, Stephen Colbert. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Before I begin, um, I've been asked to make an announcement. Um, whoever parked 14 black bulletproof SUVs out front, uh, could you please move them? They're blocking in 14 other black bulletproof SUVs. And they need to get out. Mohammed Kwatani, the power of words. The power of words, Mohammed Kwatani. <laughs> what? Outsmart, outlast, Darren Day. I'm sitting in the audience, I'm caught off guard, and now I start to like the speaker on stage. Immediately, they got the attention of their viewers and started to make them smile. That's the kind of reaction you need to get from your audience. Now, obviously, you don't need to do the same exact things that they did, but you need to get a similar reaction. And any instant icebreaker works in both funny or serious speeches. The absolute fastest and easiest way to create an instant icebreaker is to figure out what's going on at the event itself or what has happened at the event that is unusual or is in the back of their minds. The absolute fastest and easiest way for you to get an instant icebreaker is to figure out what's going on at the event itself or what has happened and is in the back of their minds of their audience. Like with Stephen Colbert, as you've just seen, a dignitary was in the audience, the President of the United States. So his instant icebreaker was about the bulletproof SUVs. Now I'm going to show you some of my favorite instant icebreakers that I've seen on stage that you can use whenever you want. And at the end, you'll be able to create your own instant icebreakers. The first one is when you notice in your audience that there's way less people than expected. You were expecting 200 people and only 25 people came. So here's your instant icebreaker. Now there was a rumor that the event was going to bring in Tony Robbins to come speak to you guys. So they invited 5,000 people. But then everybody found out it was me, so they just invited 25 people. Your audience will instantly smile and warm up to you. Another example is if you notice in the room the seating arrangements cause the people to sit closer to each other than they would like. 
So I like to use this as an instant icebreaker to kind of break the ice between trying to be cozy with each other. Now before I get started, I want you to do me a little favor. I want you to turn to the person on your left and right, and with the funniest looking face, say, I like you. I like you. This small exercise gets the audience comfortable and focused on you as a speaker instead of their uncomfortable surroundings. Ice broken, focused on you. Another example is let's say you're giving a same old presentation in front of people you know really well and they're already going to guess what kind of speech you're going to give because they've seen it a hundred times or they are just really good friends of yours. So I like to use this as an instant icebreaker to boost your confidence, to boost their confidence in you, and to make them laugh, just to break that ice. Applause. Applause, come on. I'm about to give an awesome presentation. It'll force those familiar people into an exercise to get them going and focused on your newly formed connection with the audience. Another one is if you want to try to get a standing ovation at the end of your speech, then you can use this instant icebreaker from the beginning and with a small modification at the end as well. Here's version number one. Hello everybody. I hope everyone's doing great today. Now just to get started, I want you guys to do an exercise. I want everybody who was born in the months of January, February, and March to please stand up. Okay, now for you guys, I want you to hold, just hold your hands like this. Just hold them like this. Now, can I have all the people born in the months of April, May, and June to stand up? Now, can you hold your hands like this? Now, people born in the months of July, August, and September to please stand up. Now, can you hold your hands just like this? Now, the people born in October, November, and December, please stand up. And go like this with a peace sign. Now, hold that for just a second. All right, now I can go back and tell everybody that I got a standing ovation at the event. Now, with a small modification, here's just a small change that you can make at the end of your speech with that same icebreaker. Thank you for having me today, guys. I appreciate you guys coming. Can everyone born in the months of January, February, and March, please stand up? And April, May, June, July, August, September, October, November, December. I'm going to miss you guys. Thank you guys so much. You have a great day. Love you guys. Take care. Now, all of this exercise will help you get a standing ovation at the end because it'll make them feel involved as well as you kind of remembered their birthday. So with all of that, along with a very good videographer, you can really show people just how amazing of a speech you did. Chances are the people are too lazy or too shy to stand up anyways, so they'll appreciate this. I saved my best one for last. Now let's say your speech is in the morning and people are sleepy, or let's say it's an ongoing event and it's taking too long, people just want to go home. So I like to use this to break the ice. Hello everybody, thanks for having me. Now before we get started, I want you guys to do something really quick for me. Can you guys move this way a little bit? Now move this way a little bit. Now touch your face. Okay, good. Guys, I don't think I should be speaking anymore on the stage because all of you have already been moved and touched by me. That's so punny, so punny. Now before I finish off this part, I do want to mention that somewhere at the beginning of your speech, either before the instant icebreaker or after the instant icebreaker, you do want to welcome or thank the person 
who brought you to the stage. Depending on how your speech is organized, figure out where to fit that in. And it's even more polite to thank the event organizers and the sponsors for hosting the event. Now, of course, if you're just doing it at a school or university or work, just thank your boss or professor. It's common courtesy to do this. And plus, it gives you brownie points. To finish off part one, here's a list of things that are going on during the event that are unusual and that could be in the minds of your audience and you could use these as instant icebreakers. Here's a spreadsheet to help you out. Consider the weather as a possibility. Maybe it was really raining outside like crazy or it was really cold or really hot. Maybe the timing of the event. The, it's in the morning or way in the evening and people want to go home or stuff like that. Maybe the amount of people in the room is a factor. Maybe there's too few people, so many empty chairs. Or maybe there's too many people, it's crowded like crazy. Maybe there's certain people in the room, dignitaries, or maybe a clown, an entertainer, or something that stands out. Maybe the temperature of the room, maybe it's too hot or too cold, consider that. Maybe it's too long of an event, people want to go home, and people are tired, they're looking sleepy, and they're not even going to give you a chance. Maybe there's background noise in the event. Maybe there are firefighters outside or anything going on. Maybe the audience is hungry and people have been speaking for too long and they just want to eat. Maybe there's interesting gifts that people received. Maybe people received certain chocolates that are really tasty or something. Maybe the cell phones keep going off and it's really annoying. It's like the fifth cell phone that hasn't been turned off. Consider all these things while making your instant icebreakers. Pause the video now and write them down. Now, changing your thought process. Section one, making it relatable. Now that you said something to get your audience's attention, it's now time to start writing your story. Yes, your story. This could take you the longest out of all the 10 parts because we're establishing how your mindset should be while outlining your whole speech. It's time to restructure everything that you thought was a good speech. So hang tight and don't get bored. Again, I need to straighten some things out right now. If you're ever planning on giving a speech on a summary of things or a summary of events, or a content-oriented presentation, or at any point in your speech making you feel uncomfortable speaking about yourself in anything whatsoever, then I got news for you. Nobody will care about your speech, let alone remember anything about your speech. That's because people don't want to feel they're being preached to or told that there are problems in the company and that if they don't get solved, then they're gone. They probably already know that there are problems in the company, but why aren't they reacting to them? It's because they need you as a speaker to make it relatable to them, and they need you as a reference to react to them properly. So they need you to give personal anecdotes of what you went through so that they don't go through the same thing or continue going through the same thing. Any speaker in the world and any person in the world can give advice to anybody. It's the easiest thing to do. But it takes a great speaker to show that advice through personal anecdotes. So you're wondering what to write at the beginning of your speech. When you're thinking of the start of your talk, that you don't want to get serious so soon. Nobody wants to hear anything serious at the beginning of their speech. Once you do that, if you do do that, then you'll start having your audience member saying stuff like this. <sighs> Nobody cares. Or they'll start looking at their phones as many times as possible. If you do need to add a ton of content and a summary of things in your speech, then mix it in with a lot of personal stories of yours so that the audience can remember it better and that they can relate to it better. If you do that, then they'll start saying to themselves things like this. 
Well, that's kind of happened to me before. Or, oh, I didn't realize that. Don't use the third person whenever you're speaking. People want to know about you, not someone else or something else. Martin Luther King's speech, I Have a Dream, is considered one of the greatest speeches ever written. But do you really think it would have had the same effect on people if he said something like, I knew a guy named Robert and he had a dream that one day his four children would grow up and not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. Robert had a dream. Can you notice the difference? Martin Luther King said, I have a dream. He related his feelings to the audience and not someone else's feelings. So the connection was made. And he didn't make a connection to Robert's feelings or the boss's feelings or his coworkers' feelings or his fellow students' feelings. When you're on stage, people want to know about you, not someone else. And do you remember in your school days when nobody in the classroom was listening to the teacher, but then suddenly the teacher started to relate the material to a personal story of theirs? It may have sounded something like this. You know, Abraham Lincoln kind of reminds me of my own father. He was always so tall and lanky, but he was also very gentle and kind. I'm really proud that my own father resembles the same person who saved our country during its darkest time in history. I guarantee you that years after hearing your teacher's personal stories, you remember the material in their classes way better than the other teacher's classes. That's because they were able to make the material relatable to the audience members, the students. And anyways, you learned way more in their classes than the other teachers because of this. I still wish I could be as tall as Abraham Lincoln. At this time, I want you to write down the last time you ever spoke about in front of a group of people, whether it's short or any speech. It could be a family gathering speech, a company report, a school presentation, a Toastmasters speech, or just a speech in front of a group of people, anything. I want you to try to remember as much as you can. Try to write down word for word, if it's possible. Now, after you do that, I want you to see where within the speech you could have made a difference in terms of making it more relatable to your audience. What short or personal or long story could you have added to make your overall speech more likable, more sincere, more funny? So go and pause the video now and write down how you could have added to make the speech, but make sure it's about you. As I've said, you got a humorous leaning speech and a heartfelt leaning speech. Now, whatever type of speech or speaker you want to be, do not skip the other one because both of them are very important to learn from each other and you can incorporate all the tips and overlap them. Have you ever seen the Emmy Awards? The two biggest awards are best comedy and best drama. That's because comedy and drama or funny speeches and serious speeches are like apples and oranges. You can't compare them. I think the Oscars could learn something from them. Let's get started and take one at a time. Now, if your speech is humor leaning, then you've got to think of all the problems that you have that you could poke fun at. What are your vulnerabilities? What are the things that people have in the back of their minds, but they're too polite not to say to you? For example, I've had a problem growing up of being gullible and believing everything that people told me. For example, as a kid, somebody would say, Jonathan, do not go into your room. There are aliens there. They're going to abduct you and they're not going to bring you back. Then my first reaction was, well, that's not good. What do we do? I, I can't fight them alone. We got to call the police. 
then I would start writing down all the embarrassing moments where I believed other people's lies. It would make me feel uncomfortable, but it would be the best way to have the audience relate to me and connect with me. And trust me, they're not laughing at you. They're laughing with you. They're saying things like, oh, I've got a friend who's similar to that too. And guys, this is advice from Public Speaking 101. The more humble you are on stage, the more the audience will respect and remember you. Again, the more humble you are on stage, the more the audience will respect and remember you. That obviously means the more you preach on stage, the more they won't listen to you. Always remember that if you truly want to be funny on stage, then you've got to make fun of yourself as much as possible, or else the audience will not remember your speech or laugh as hard. A lot of comedians rely on racial stereotypes or impersonations to get the audience to laugh. And although that is funny, nothing ever beats the originality of self-deprecating humor. Famous comedian Jerry Seinfeld said, the more that you are being you, the funnier it is. You simply cannot have more powerful humor than self-deprecating humor. And everybody's got something about themselves that they could poke fun at. It's going to take a few deep breaths for you to manage to release your vulnerabilities about yourselves. But I have faith that you'll actually do it in front of an audience. At this time, I want you to write down at least three vulnerabilities about yourselves that people could poke fun at, you could poke fun at yourself about, or people have in the back of their minds, but they, they're just too polite to not say them to you. And as you write these down, keep in mind of the golden rule. The more humble you are on stage, the more the audience will respect and remember you. Here are some possibilities. So when doing your funny speech, consider making fun of yourself in terms of maybe your body weight. Maybe you're okay with making fun of how fat you are, like comedian Gabriel Iglesias does it all the time. Or maybe you're too skinny. Maybe you have a funny voice, and when you, whenever you talk, people can't help but laugh. Maybe you have a stuttering problem, and you just want to make fun of that. Maybe you speak too loudly, and you just never notice it, and people are like stepping back to hear you. Maybe you speak too quietly, and people are stepping forward to hear you. Maybe you're mentally handicapped, and you're ready to make fun of yourself for that. Same thing goes with physically handicapped. And something about you, you're just willing to poke fun at to refresh the minds of your audience. Maybe you have certain addictions going on. Maybe you smoke too much, and that also goes along with bad habits. Maybe you have twitches. You twitch your head all the time, and you just want to make fun of that. Maybe you have loud laughs, really loud and weird laugh, too. And people are like, whoa, okay, it's not funny anymore. Maybe you have bad habits, like smoking, like I said, or maybe you're just too bossy and you're ready to make fun of that for you. And maybe there are embarrassing moments in your life that only happen to you and it's really awkward, but when you talk about it, it's, it comes off as hilarious. Or maybe you have a certain background, maybe you're Arab or black or something that is different from the majority that you're ready to poke fun at and people are ready to laugh about. Pause the video now and write them down. The golden rule that I mentioned for funny speeches also applies to serious speeches or heartfelt leaning speeches. The more humble you are on stage, the more the audience will respect and remember you. Now moving on to heartfelt leaning speeches. If you're having this kind of speech, then think about all the experiences in your life that have tremendously impacted you, but you speak rarely about. In other words, what are the kinds of events that if you were even to speak about them in front of one person, you would probably cry. And if you speak about it at all, you would have to constantly question yourself why you're doing this. Or you could say, you know what, this could get me in trouble one day with my coworkers, my friends, my family, my enemies. But it's those kinds of speeches 
that move mountains and solidify themselves into the memory of your audience. If you truly want to inspire or motivate your audience, then you've got to talk about your traumatic experiences. And while you're dwelling on the past, it's important to remember that whenever you're talking about those difficult things, the audience is going to feel the same thing that you're feeling. If it's something that'll make you cry, the audience will cry with you because they directly feel what you are feeling. The deeper it is that you reveal it to your audience, then the more relatable it'll be to them and the more that you will have the audience remember your speech for a long, long time. Just this year, I did a speech in front of a 500 person crowd talking about my parents' divorce. When I was 18 years old, my parents got divorced and it was the most traumatic experience of my life. I talked about how I felt I needed to side with my dad and then with my mom and then how my father struggled with women and how my mom struggled with forgiving anyone who ever crossed her or wronged her and how both of them said to the children that it had nothing to do with them. It took me a long time to go through that speech and I went through endless tears because every five minutes of trying to write that speech, I had to go pray to God to give me the strength. But eventually, I did it. I've had people come up to me after the speech saying that they were going through the same thing. And even during my speech, I saw people crying and turning the other way. And it was only during when I told my absolute deepest feelings was I able to get the full attention of the audience. I mean, their cell phones could be vibrating on their laps and they wouldn't even spare a second to look at it. That's how focused they were and that's the exact kind of focus that you need to have your audience on you. Please remind me of the golden rule. At this time, I want you to write down at least three difficult experiences that you have had in your life and as you write them down, please remember that the deeper it is and the more you reveal it, then the audience will see that humbleness, that humility, and they will respect and remember you even longer. Here's a spreadsheet. Consider these things whenever you really want to touch the hearts of your audience. Maybe you were neglected as a child and you really felt traumatized from that. You were like not the favorite child and you were just in the house, but people didn't really care about your presence. Or maybe you were born with no money or poverty, or you've had this curse on you where you've never had enough money. Maybe you have certain addictions and you're ready to get serious about these things. Or maybe you were abused as a kid and different kinds of abuse and you're ready to talk about overcoming them. Maybe you are mentally and physically handicapped and you really want to give your heart to the audience in terms of those and how difficult it is every day, but how they can overcome it. Maybe you failed in school and you were never the good student in school. You were always looked at as a bad student. Maybe you had failed relationships or marriages that just never work out. You just can't ever find the right life partner. Maybe you're seen as a person always in trouble that no matter what, you're always going to be the one in the detention room growing up or the one who gets a warning letter from your company or something. Maybe you have unforgiveness issues. There's always people who wrong you that you just can't forget and you're never going to approach them to overcome. Even if they change, you can't forgive them. Maybe you have bad tempers or anger issues and whenever somebody wrongs you, you just flare out in anger and you can't control yourself. Maybe you have workaholic issues and you're always at work, you only focus about work and you forget about other aspects of your life. Maybe you're keeping up with the Joneses. For instance, if your friend gets a good car, then you gotta get a good car too. Or if your neighbors get a nice house, then you gotta get a nice house too. Maybe you have weight issues and you're ready to be serious about overcoming either being too fat or too skinny or anything like that. Consider these difficulties when writing them down. Pause the video now and write them down.
you got your instant icebreaker to get their attention. And you got your ideas on how to write a humorous leaning speech. Now we will actually write your speech. Before you do anything else, I want you to memorize the structure, the speech structure for a humorous leaning speech. I mean, right now. Do not go further in this video until you have the structure fully memorized, step by step. Pause the video now and memorize the structure. Now that the structure is fully memorized, I'm going to have you watch a humorous championship speech by my good friend, Khaled Ismail. Now, he was overjoyed to lend his speech to you guys for the purposes of you learning about humor. In 2017, he won the humorous championship speech out of the entire Middle East for his speech titled, Have Baby Now. Now, as you watch the speech, see which parts of the structure go within his speech and see where within the structure it fits. Khalid Ismail. Contest Chair, fellow Toastmasters. At the age of 12, my mother would always tell me, Colin, you're a young and handsome man. You need to find a good girl to become your wife. As I got older, Colin, you have a good car, a good job, and a somewhat good face. So please find a wife to live the good life. As I got older than old, Colin, look at you. You're getting older and potter and obviously not any taller. So please find someone who will accept you for who you are before it's too late. Surprisingly, after all those years and this body, I discovered that one day, Khalas, I was married. But before we could celebrate our union of passion in the honeymoon, my mother, my mother, with tears in her eyes, came up to me and said, Kali, oi, have baby now. Just like that, before I knew it, whatever passion the wife and I had at that moment was gone. And the next questioning chapter of my life had just started. From when are you getting married to, where's the baby? I had not even kissed my own wife yet. And she wanted the baby then and there. After the honeymoon, we returned without a baby. Because the wife and I were too busy into family planning. So much so because she believed it was baby or no baby. Because she started to blame me. Why get married if you don't want baby? So I thought my mother began to understand. She couldn't get anything out of me. So she decided to pester the wife. But that didn't work either because it takes two to tango. But please, please don't misunderstand. We may like the process just not the end result. <laughs> With that said, my mother began to be more desperate and thought of more creative ways to try and convince me to have my child. At this point, I believed she was a Toastmaster because she started to exhibit skills and facets of a very successful vice president of membership. You see, every Friday, I go to the mall to have breakfast with my mom. While we were seated and eating, she waited for a couple to walk in with a toddler and pass by. And at that moment, she began her membership campaign. <laughs> I call it. Look at her. 
She's so small. She's so cute. She's like a toy. I want one. Colin, oi, I want baby now. The week after, she tried something different. This time, as she was sitting down, I na ko Colin. Look at me. I'm getting older now, but of course, still very beautiful. <laughs> but I can feel it in my bones. I don't have much time on this earth. So please, before I close my eyes, let me see my grandchild. Colin. <laughs> Oi. Have baby now. The week after, she was far more direct. Colin. Oi. Have baby now. Go to your wife and don't come back until the baby is born. Don't worry, I'll take care of it. You can come to the house whenever you want to play with it, okay? And I thought, wow, this was a very good idea. Cost effective too. But then I remembered how my mother raised her kids. <laughs> I, for one, speaks for itself. But if you don't believe me, this is the same mother who watched my baby brother crawl to the side of the bed, fall, hit his head, and cry in pain, only for my mother to pick him up and lovingly say, such a stupid baby. <laughs> it is at this exact moment I knew where I got my sense of humor. <laughs> Ultimately, my mother gave up her membership campaign and graciously invited me to her house for breakfast which I agreed. And as I entered her house, I was greeted by a tiny little Shih Tzu dog named Chloe in her arms. See, Chloe, Carly don't want to give me baby, so I have my own baby. Hmm. And she walked away. Fellow Toastmasters, do you understand what it feels like to be replaced by a tiny little dog? And you know what's worse? That tiny little dog had babies before I did. I am being compared every day to the child-making facilities of a tiny little dog. Every day, I have struggled against my mother. And you know what? I love it. I love it and I love her. Because that's what mothers are. She always pushes me from a boy to a man, from a man to a husband, from a husband to a hopeful father. But I cannot wait for the day when she comes up to me with tears in her eyes, my mother, my mother. And she says, Colin, you have baby now. Now let's analyze which parts of the structure are within his speech. So for the icebreaker in Khalid's speech, uh, so Khalid didn't have an official icebreaker. That's because in his speech, he was on a strict time limit. But he was clever to acknowledge that. He tried tying in his catchphrase, Khalid, at the very beginning as a thing to remember at the beginning that would carry over throughout his speech. So the icebreaker is not totally there, but it's not completely forgotten either. And he did acknowledge the audience. We'll discuss more of catchphrases in part eight. Now for the introduction, now Colin pretty much starts his introduction right from the start. Do you remember how I said most speakers neglect icebreakers? Well, anyways, it's not tragic. He starts his introduction immediately with his personal story of his mother. He starts a timeline of him and his mother by saying, at the age of 12, with this constant catchphrase, Khalid, at each part of his timeline. What a fantastic way to keep the audience engaged the entire time. So here are the short personal stories that Khalid uses in his introduction. 
he starts off in chronological order with three simple things. At the age of 12, find a good wife to become your wife. And then he gets into the phrase older, he has a good car, he has a good job, and a somewhat good face, so find a girl to live the good life. And then he says older than old, which is related to the previous one, and then he says you're getting older and fatter and obviously not any taller. So find someone before it's too late. Now I would always say that two personal examples are more than enough for your introduction, but Khalid uses three. He was able to deviate from this golden rule by keeping the examples chronological and very short. And he kept the audience entertained and focused by constantly saying his catchphrase, Khalid. Now we get to the body. Now he starts his body of his speech by saying, surprisingly, after all these years in this body, I was married. That's the sentence that lets the audience know that he's now transitioning from the introduction to the body. He then immediately makes himself very vulnerable by using the word passion in the honeymoon being gone because his mother said, have baby now. And that's the title of his speech. Now when the audience sees the title of his speech, they want to soon know why that was the title. This was a good time for him to mention it. The title itself is quite vulnerable, and it's very relatable that many parents out there want to see their grandkids right away. So he's exposing those situations in a vulnerable and relatable way, which draws a lot of laughs from the audience. And he gets deeper into the awkwardness of his mother pushing him to have a baby. And with each tactic the mother uses, he says, Khalid, to keep the audience entertained and saying to themselves, oh, you know, my mother does that too. He also makes the environment relatable to a Toastmasters crowd by saying vice president of membership. He knew the majority of his audience would understand that joke. Now the most, the most vulnerable part comes toward the end when he compares himself to the Shih Tzu dog which then had babies before Khalid did. At the start of his conclusion, after Khalid mentions the most vulnerable part of him to the audience to draw the most laughs, then that is the best time to introduce the conclusion. He starts the conclusion by saying, every day I have struggled against my mother, and you know what? I love it. I love it and I love her, because that's what mothers are. Now this part isn't exactly funny because he's now trying to give advice to the audience. This gives a signal that he's nearly done with his speech. And he ends the speech in a cute and funny way of advice, not in a strong advice giving way that heartfelt leaning speeches do. He ends it cutely by saying, Khalid, you have baby now. The audience loves it because they not only laughed throughout the whole speech, but they also learned something. Those two things combined are what you need the audience to leave with if you want your speech to be remembered. Now, did you notice that Khalid's vulnerability of his mom wasn't as vulnerable in the beginning as it was in the middle? Now, what if he switched it where he had a big vulnerability part of his Khalid in the very beginning instead of later on? The audience could laugh, but they would be more of confused. It would feel like it just kind of came out of nowhere, and they wouldn't really know how to react. You really need a lighter part of your vulnerability at the beginning to lead up to that big one in the middle so that the audience could easily follow and laugh harder. Now let's say you have a funny voice and you're ready to reveal that deep vulnerability of yours to the audience. I would give an instant icebreaker of you saying the funny voice in a funny way. Then I would recall one or two short and funny moments of you being made fun of as a kid or fellow classmates trying to imitate you. Then that big vulnerability of yours, I would say a job interview that 
for a job I really wanted, so I ended up trying to change my voice completely. And you told the, and I told the job interviewer that I had strep throat, but then I got hired and everybody avoided me in the office because they saw me as the sick person. At the conclusion, I would say that I learned not to lie even if I wanted something really badly. And I would advise the audience to accept and embrace their natural problems without the hassle of trying to hide them. Do you see how that entire structure helped the audience follow me step by step? Follow the structure I told you and you will have an amazing speech. Remember this the most. Your speech will never ever be perfect the first time that you write it, but that's why they call it a first draft. I want you to spend as much time as you need writing the first draft of your speech. And after you do it, look at it again an hour later and re-edit it. But remember this the most. It will not be perfect by today's end. I want you to take as much time as you need. And when you get to a point where you're ready to show it to a friend or family member to read it out to them, ask for their feedback. Ask for as much feedback as you can. Because here's the thing, the audiences want to listen to certain things and you as a speaker want to say certain things. You do not share the same mindset. So the more feedback you get, the more your mind will expand on what actually makes a great speech. So go and write the first draft of your speech and take as much time as you need. And when you get to a point where you're ready to read it out to a family member, then do so and get whatever feedback is needed. Rewatch college speech if necessary, but take whatever precautions you need and here's a structure to help you out just in case you need some guidance. So pause the video and write your first draft. Now let's start your heartfelt leaning speech. By the way, if you skipped part three on writing a humorous leaning speech, tough luck for you. That's like watching Game of Thrones season seven without watching season six. You're gonna miss a few things. So if you can manage it, please go back to watch part three before starting this section. You've got your instant icebreaker to get your audience's attention. You've got your ideas on how to write a serious speech. Now we will actually write your serious speech. Before you do anything else, and I mean anything else, memorize the structure I'm about to show you right now. Do not go further in this video until you have the structure fully memorized step by step. Pause the video now and memorize the structure. Tell me what you've noticed. That's right. The only differences between the humorous leaning structure and the heartfelt leaning structure are the introduction and body. Both speeches are equally important and should be spoken at in different times in different environments. Now your main goal in serious speeches is to use the problems that you've personally faced to motivate, inspire, and lead your audience. You can make it entertaining and funny, but mainly in the beginning part. For this exercise, I'm gonna show you former WWF World Wrestling Champion, Mark Merrow's middle school speech. As you watch the speech, see where within the structure, where they apply within his speech. And there is an instant icebreaker, but it's a little tricky. By the way, you may want a tissue box for this speech. 
My mom would be at all my sporting events. Let's say I was playing football, okay? My mother would be on the sidelines, and if the play on the field started going one way, my mother would run along like, Mike, get him, get him! I'd be like, oh my gosh. I'd get in the huddle with the other guys, they go, Mark, is that your mother? I go, no, I never saw her before in my life. <laughs> the greatest gift my mother ever gave me, she believed in me. I have overdosed on drugs on three occasions where I should have been dead. But I believe I was kept here for a reason. You show me your friends, I will show you your future. How do I know this? I hung out with losers and I became the biggest loser of them all because I gave up everything I dreamt about as a little boy because of who I chose to surround myself with. My friends would drive me home at two, three, four in the morning. We'd be drunk and high, laughing in the car. We'd pull up in front of my house in New York. They go, Mark, Mark, the light's on. I go, oh man, my mother's up. See, my mom wouldn't go to bed until she knew her son was still alive. I'd walk in, she'd say, hi, Mark, how was your night? I go, it was good, mom, I'm just gonna go to bed. She goes, can I, can I talk to you for a minute? I go, mom, I'm tired, I'm just gonna go to bed. She goes, Mark, I haven't seen you all day and all night. Can I please talk to you? I said, man, just leave me alone. You bug me. I'd slam my bedroom door on the one person who believed in me. I was on a worldwide tour when we were wrestling overseas in Japan. After my wrestling match, I went upstairs in my hotel room and I fell asleep. There was a knock at my door at three o'clock in the morning. I got out of bed and I looked through the safety window and I could see it was a Japanese promoter. So I opened the door and he said, Mark, you need to call home. There's been an emergency. I went and got on the hotel room phone. I called back to the United States and said, hey, what's going on? They said, Mark, I don't know how to tell you this. I said, just tell me what happened. All of a sudden they started crying. They go, Mark, I can't tell you. I said, just say it. They said, Mark, your mother died. I just threw the phone down. I ran out of my hotel room. I took the elevator to the lobby and when the doors opened up, I just ran out into the street. I mean, there was no cars, there was no people. It's three o'clock in the morning. And I walked down the middle of a street in Hiroshima, Japan. And I remember looking up and just saying, Mom, I am so sorry. I flew home for her funeral and I was so nervous to walk up to her casket. So I just stood way in the back. And I kept looking from a distance. I kept thinking to myself, Mom, please wake up. Please get up. And then I finally got the nerve to walk up to her. And as I got closer, I could see my mom for the first time. I mean, she was so beautiful. She, she was dressed in white. I mean, she looked like an angel. And I just stood over and I said, Mom, you are my hero. Everything I am, everything I hoped to be was because of you. You loved me so much. You gave me a life. You're the only one that ever believed in me. How did I repay her? By getting drunk, by getting high, by getting stupid, by hanging out with losers? For what? All she ever wanted to do was talk to me. I wish I could talk to you now, Mom. I wish you could see what I'm doing. Why couldn't I have been a better son? We are defined by our choices. But if you surround yourself with people involved in drugs and alcohol and pills, it's a dead end. I'm not here to preach to you. I'm here to tell you I lived that life. It leads to broken hearts, broken relationships, broken dreams, and death. For what, to get high? If you have a mother or a father, when you go home, tell them how much you love them. See, my whole life was about being rich and famous. I had to be a millionaire. I had to win the race. I had to win the race to expense my marriage, my family, my friends for what? To be all alone in the world? I learned what is truly important, and that is how precious this gift of life is and our families and how quickly it can be taken away. See, I no longer live in time, I live in moments. See, it's not what's in your pocket that matters, it's what's in your heart that truly matters. Love, 
Love is just a word until somebody comes along and gives it meaning. You, you're the meaning. Now let's analyze which parts of the structure are within his speech. Now for Mark's speech in the icebreaker, the thing about Mark's speech is that the instant icebreaker is indirect. The fact that he's a wrestling celebrity speaking to a middle school audience makes his actual presence as the icebreaker. It's definitely, it definitely would have been better if he actually had a verbal icebreaker, but his situation more or less excused him from it. Just imagine if there's a meeting at your workplace or school or university, and then the Queen of England walks in. Her presence itself would be an indirect icebreaker. Now for the introduction, now just like Khalid, Mark starts his speech off right from the introduction. Come on guys, stop ignoring my instant icebreakers. Gosh. But also like Khalid, he talks about his mother. For the introduction, Mark breaks the golden rule of having two short stories of entertainment. He only uses one of them, referring to his mother being at his American football game. Of course, it probably would have been more effective if he used one more story. His opening phrase, my mother would always be at all of my sporting events, ties into his actual purpose of his speech to appreciate your mother because his mother was always there for him. He put that phrase in during a funny story so that it could tie in to the emotional part of his serious story of his mother when he would reach his body. His mother would run up the side lanes like crazy, showed that his mother truly cared for him. It related to the middle school audience because it's guaranteed that many of their own parents also embarrass them at sporting events as well. Since it was relatable to them, it kept the audience focused and entertained. I would have advised Mark not to laugh at his own joke when telling his fellow players, no, I never saw her before in my life. If he kept a straight face on that part, it would have been funnier. Now for the body, now comes the part of Mark's speech that made this YouTube video go viral. He transitions from the entertaining story of his mother to the serious story when he says, the greatest gift my mother ever gave me, she believed in me. That then allows him to get serious about appreciating your mothers, or fathers for that matter. He uses his personal struggle, struggles and screw-ups of ignoring his mother and how it came about step by step. He also uses a chronological order for the body in the same way Khalid did for his introduction. The first one, he came home at 2 to 3 in the morning being drunk and high with losers and ignoring his mother's plea to talk with him. Then the next one, he was in Japan when he got a phone call that his mother died. Then the third one, he said he was so sorry in the streets. And then the fourth one, he said, you are my hero when he saw his mom's casket. Each chronological part of his body is short and none of them are longer than the other. It's definitely okay to do this in the body because he's gradually getting more regretful after each step. When he says, why couldn't have I been a better son? That's when he's at rock bottom and fully acknowledges his regret. Now comes the conclusion. The deepest part of his regret is a great time to transition to the conclusion. He starts his conclusion by saying, we are defined by our choices. But if you surround yourself with people involved with drugs and alcohol and pills, it's a dead end. He's allowed to say this advice because he showed through his own examples how bad it can be. If he said that advice, at the very beginning of his speech, it would have absolutely no effect on the audience at all. And he continues to give emotional advice to his audience by telling the audience to go to their parents to tell them that they love them. Now, I wanna finish off Mark's speech by asking this one question. 
How was his speech so effective to the audience? How did he get just about everyone to cry? In part seven, we're going to go over unfair advantages for you as a speaker that only you or very few people can pull off. For Mark, his unfair advantage was his voice. His natural voice sounded emotional. As he got deeper in his regrets and gave advice, his sad sounding voice was able to help get his message across more effectively than if a different speaker doing the same exact speech could. I couldn't pull off the same effect as him because his natural voice is more effective than mine. But that also means that I have other unfair advantages, just not his. And the same goes for you. Now, did you notice that in Mark's speech, he put the serious story second instead of first? He put the funny stuff first. What if he switched it where the funny part was after the serious part? Do you really think the overall message to his audience would be having the same effect? Think about it. The audience would be walking out of the room saying things like, he was all right. Instead of, you know, I should probably call my mom just to say that I love her. Jeez. Which words do you want to put in the minds of your audience as they walk out of the room? What do they want to take away from your speech long after you actually say it? Now, a lot of you watching this will be concerned about speaking at a school or company presentation, as I've said, and you got a lot of content to say. But if you mix that in with the structure that I've shown you, then you will have an amazing presentation. For example, let's say that you are at your company and you got to tell your employees that sales are going down, it's the fault of the employees. That sounds pretty sorrowful. So I would give kind of an instant icebreaker to engage them. Then I would recall one or two moments where I succeeded in sales and that's both funny and engaging. And then I would get serious and say how I failed in my past and I hit rock bottom, but then I managed to climb back out. In the advisable conclusion, it is now time to reveal to the audience directly that sales are down and it is the fault of the employees. And the focus is how you got out of your own slump so that they can get out of their own problems too. And they use you as a reference to get out of it. I guarantee you that if you write your first draft like that and modify it days afterwards, then your employees will do way more than you actually expected them to do because they appreciated that reference of you instead of preaching to them. And if, but if you don't listen to any of my advice, if you simply write a speech very serious at the beginning saying sales are down or you're going to get fired, then they're just going to do enough to not get fired. Again, remember this the most. Your speech will not be perfect the first time you write it, but that's why they call it a first draft. I want you to take as much time as you need to write the first draft of your speech, but it will not be perfect by today's end. After you write the speech, then I want you to look at it again, maybe an hour later or two hours later, whatever you're comfortable with and re-edit it. And when you get to a point where you feel comfortable, reading it out to a friend or family member, then do that and get their feedback. Their feedback is precious because the audience member listening and you speaking do not have the same mindset. It's they want to listen to certain things. You want to say certain things. So expand your mindset by as much feedback as possible so that you can connect to your audience more. So go and write your first draft of your speech. And when you get to a point, where you're comfortable reading it out to a friend or family member, then go and do so. 
Rewatch Mark's speech if necessary, but it will not be perfect by the end of today. Here's the structure to help you out. Go and write your first draft. So you got at least your first draft written with a really funny and engaging icebreaker. You got your ideas on how to write your speech and you got all the speech structure on writing your speech. So you've reached your conclusion. By the way, I'm really proud of you for sticking around till this point. You're really getting closer to mastering the art of public speaking. As I've said from the start of this tutorial, whether it's a funny or serious speech, your message to the audience is the most important part of your speech. You should always consider the audience's point of view. Why should I listen to you? What am I getting out of it? If you have a really good icebreaker, a really good introduction and body, but no conclusion, then your entire speech is wasted. You're going to leave the audience wondering why you said all those things in the first place without leaving them food for thought because the food for thought is what makes them remember your speech. The biggest mistake that speakers make is putting the advice at the beginning of their speeches instead of at the end. When you do this, the audience will feel that you're preaching to them and forcing words into their mouths. They'll start looking at their phones instead of actually listening to you and then they'll feel resentful for even watching your whole speech. Oh, thank God he's done. Don't do that. Only after a very relatable story can you give proper advice. And even then, you have to make it very sincere to them. Let's quickly rewatch Colin and Mark's conclusions. Every day I have struggled against my mother. And you know what? I love it. I love it and I love her. Because that's what mothers are. She always pushes me. From a boy to a man. From a man to a husband. From a husband to a hopeful father. But I cannot wait for the day when she comes up to me with tears in her eyes. My mother my mother and she says Colin you have baby now we are defined by our choices but if you surround yourself with people involved in drugs and alcohol and pills it's a dead end I'm not here to preach to you I'm here to tell you I live that life it leads to broken hearts broken relationships broken dreams and death for what? To get high? If you have a mother or a father, when you go home, tell them how much you love them. See, my whole life was about being rich and famous. I had to be a millionaire. I had to win the race. I had to win the race to expense my marriage, my family, my friends. For what? To be all alone in the world? I learned what is truly important, and that is how precious this gift of life is and our families and how quickly it can be taken away. See, I no longer live in time. I live in moments. See, it's not what's in your pocket that matters. It's what's in your heart that truly matters. Love, love is just a word until somebody comes along and gives it meaning. You, you're the meaning. Like in college speech, the advice is very subtle and even indirect. That's okay to have it in a funny speech because then the laughter will go down if the advice is too much in a funny speech. In Mark's speech, however, it's more than okay to not be subtle because the advice can carry on with the serious story. But both speeches Leave the audience with food for thought immediately after they finish. That's your ultimate goal. 
Now, if I was telling the audience of how I was gullible, then I would give my instant icebreaker. I would recall one or two short and funny moments where I believed people's lies growing up. And then I would tell a really embarrassing story of how I believed my best friend's lies in school about a girl that I liked. And he came to me and said that she liked me back and that she wanted me to dress up in a suit and tie on the next day of school and bring flowers and sing to her. And then I did and got a big fat no. And everybody was laughing, including my best friend who was dying of laughter on the ground. Then in the advisable conclusion, I would say this. Dear friends, I found out the hard way to always be careful to believe something that somebody tells you, especially if there's somebody close to you. But if you're as dumb as me, then you probably just blew a chance with someone who could have been the love of your life. Now, did you notice that I blended the funny part of my speech with the conclusion part? Because a subtle conclusion is the key for funny speakers. Now, if I was telling the audience a serious story of how I had anger issues and I was overcoming them, then I would say this. By the way, I don't have anger issues, so please get that out of your minds. But let's say I did and I wanted to inspire the audience to overcome them. Then I would give my instant icebreaker. I would show one or two funny instances where I shouted at my friends or family. Then I would say in my body how I shouted at my coworkers and my boss, and then I got fired. And then I found out that they gave me a horrible reference letter and they wanted to blacklist me. And then I had a hard time getting a job and then my wife saw that as the last straw to our relationship and she wanted to separate from me. Then my conclusion would be something like this. Now all of you sitting here today may not have anger issues, but we've all had anger moments in our lives and have dealt with other people with anger problems and don't know the consequences. You may find a company or a spouse who could deal with it in the beginning and portray it as not a big deal. But eventually, you're going to have to change if the things in your lives are important enough. I refused to change, and I lost everything. I also didn't care about the consequences. And I'm telling you here today that if you can't be a good example, then you'll have to be a horrible warning like me. Be the example of change that everyone aspires to, and your life will flourish. At this time, I want you to do two things. I want you to go back to your speech and start taking the advice that I gave you and rewrite your conclusion or modify it. Your message to the audience is the most important thing. After you do that, I want you to take out a separate piece of paper and write at the top, food for thought. Think of three different things that you want to put in the minds of your audience as they walk out of the room. What are the three phrases you want them to say as they are exiting the hall? In college speech, it was something like, <laughs> I got a friend who's exactly like you. In Mark's speech, it was something like, I think I should really send a text to my mom saying I love her. Pause the video now and do these two things. Now that you've finished writing your speech, it's now time to start enhancing it. It's like you baked a cake and put on the frosting, but what about all the decorations? Let's get going. Your body language on stage is crucial. Writing a speech is one thing, but if you deliver it poorly, then the audience won't be too excited to listen to you. 
they may come up to you and say, oh, that was a great speech. But they'll forget a lot of things because you looked so bored, nervous, and uninterested while on stage. And avoid this invisible box area around your torso as much as possible. It shows that you're nervous if you keep your hands in this area. And if your audience picks up on that nervousness, then they won't listen to you. And by all means, do not put your hands in a class form as you're speaking. Pure nervousness right there. And by all means, do not stand there like a statue without moving during your whole speech, even if it's a podium. Move around. Because if you stand there the whole time, and I'm in the audience, then I will personally put my headphones in and start listening to music the whole time. Now, hand gestures help your audience visualize what you're trying to tell them as much as you can. Now, if you saw a rocket go up into space, then visualize it with your hand gestures and make noises too. It helps the audience stay focused on you. Now, look at how big your stage area will be in terms of where you'll be speaking and how much open space there will be. If you stand in one spot during the whole time, then one part of the audience will feel that you're speaking only to them. The other parts will feel left out. So in order to make them feel included and recognized, you need to move around the stage throughout your speech. But don't move aimlessly like this, just kind of moving around as you're talking like this. Move with a purpose. And when you're transitioning, for example, from your introduction to your body, then that would be a good time to move from one part of the stage to the other so that everybody can feel part of your speech. And don't look at one person the whole time. I know some speakers do that. Don't be that creepy person who only looks at a certain person. Make everybody feel part of your speech. For voice modulation, if you have a monotonous voice, then your speech is dead. It doesn't matter how great it is. Nobody will be excited to listen to it at all. I want to say that right now. Does that remind you of some of the teachers that you've had in your school days? Also, the teachers who had sleepy voices while giving a lecture made everybody sleep in their seats. Oh wait, you're probably sleeping right now. Maybe I should just stop talking. Being too loud is also annoying. Nobody wants to feel they're being screamed at while you're talking. If you have a naturally loud voice, then ask somebody and they'll tell you to bring it down a notch. Now, different parts of your speech will require you to have a different voice modulation. For your instant icebreaker, it will look and sound as if you're giving clear instructions to a person. The icebreaker is quick, so you got to be loud enough for everybody to hear you and also have as clear a pronunciation as possible. And don't speak too fast. If any of these problems occur during your icebreaker, then it's a terrible way to start your speech. Nobody will laugh or get it, and they'll all be confused, and it'll set the tone for your speech. For your introduction and body, you've got to be as engaging as possible. You've got to help the audience visualize what you're trying to tell them. If you're talking about your vulnerabilities, then act them out. If you're talking about how you're fat and you're trying to run, don't tell the audience, oh, just imagine a fat person trying to run. That's not as funny as demonstrating it to them. <laughs> I was like this. That'll draw more laughs. Or if my aliens part of being gullible, then I would actually act out going to the room. I wouldn't say, oh, there were aliens in my room and I wouldn't go in there. That's not funny. 
but going to the room, creeping up, opening the door. Ah, where's the police? We're going to call the police. I don't want to see anymore. They're probably in, hiding in the corner. That is more engaging. If you're at the part of your speech where you hit rock bottom, then have a softer voice so that the audience can feel those emotions and maybe come closer to the audience as well so that they can feel part of it as much as possible. At the start of your conclusion, it's advised to back up and have a slightly higher voice. That'll give the signal to the audience that you're almost done with your speech. It'll get them on the same page as you and it will help them remember your speech better. And when you finish your conclusion, for serious speakers, you can come closer, lower your voice, and come closer to the audience and give some emotional flair so that they can feel your feelings more. You get it? And if you're going to ask me, uh, Jonathan, how do I get rid of the nervousness when I'm on stage? How do, how do I stop shaking or like, what do I do? And I'm going to tell you that the more prepared you are on stage, the less nervous you will be. Again, the more prepared you are and more hours you put in beforehand practicing your speech, in your body movements and voice modulation, the more you will be confident on stage. There are millions of examples that I could give you, but I would like you to try to figure them out themselves because that's where true learning comes from. At this time, I want you to look at your speech again. I want you to go back to see where and within your speech you can practice your body language and your voice modulation. See where it could fit in. As you record it, just see where it fits correctly, at which parts of your speech you're moving, at which parts of the speech you're speaking. Record it if you can and look back at the video to see where you could improve on it. This may take some days for you to finish and to finalize, but if you want the absolute best speech that you possibly can get, then I suggest you practice all these things. Pause the video now and finalize your body language and voice modulation for your instant icebreaker, for your introduction and body, and for your conclusion. Good luck. Now, everybody has something about them that is different from most people or just about anybody. That something, when emphasized, will make your speech sound so much better than what the audience has heard before. What is that unfair advantage that you have that other speakers will have a hard time pulling off whenever they're on stage? It could be the way you speak your weird voice modulation, your body weight, your body shape, your culture, your heritage, your religion, your accent, your family background, or certain moments in your life that only happened to you or only a few people. Here are a list of examples of speakers who use their unique traits about them to their advantage while speaking to an audience. Why don't you move here? Then you'd have a bigger place. Do you like it here? But I mean, I don't fit in here. Just straight, like straight up body type. Like in LA, my arms register as legs. No. They're just like, <laughs> they're like, why is that octopus on sunset? Is that? I learned a lot. I learned that my resting face is just a scowl. It's just. <laughs> And I learned, you could see, that I have what I'm now calling an at-risk chin. Ah. Um, this is not a good section. 
If I, if I don't, like, keep it at sea level, it just doubles itself, just. I become the dinosaur in the Jeep in Jurassic Park, just. <laughs> and so that's what happened. If you Google me, it's me. And I yeah. learned, I look like her, actually. I look like her if she were stung by a million bees. <laughs> it's true. I look like her if she were, like, becoming the Hulk. Uh, that's... <laughs>And your mom walked in, you were thinking, I'm gonna be a musician. Your mom walked in and went, Sandu. Because <laughs> that's all you need to do for an Indian nickname. All you need is add two O's to whatever you want the nickname to be. Your mom walked in, Sandu. <laughs> You're going to college. Why don't you become a doctor? <laughs> and you were like, what's wrong with your face? <laughs> if you become a doctor, you can fix it. <laughs> so you put your guitar down and picked up stethoscope and it was all over after that. That's why I could never go to you. <laughs>
So I'm standing in line at the ATM. And then this scary looking guy stands right behind me. And he's got one of those face masks on where you can only see the eyes and the mouth. And then he's moving his hands in his jacket pocket. And I see out of the corner of my eye that he's reaching over to grab my shoulder. So I turn around and I grab his hands as fast as I can. I don't know what to do. And then he says, dude, it's your turn at the ATM. And by the way, I'm married. You see, I misled the audience to believe that the guy was going to rob me. But I twisted it where it was just my turn at the ATM. The audience was caught off guard and I got my laughs. Another part of humor is using the first person. I've mentioned this many times before because I can't say it enough. If I had simply said, this guy grabbed his hands, instead of, I grabbed his hands, then the audience wouldn't relate to me. They wouldn't really follow me as far because it's not relatable. You would be trying to relate it to someone else who they don't know and the audience would be looking around looking at their phones. Always, always, always use the first person to keep the audience focused on you. Now comes pauses in your speeches. This helps both in funny and serious speeches. Let's say I say something like this. My bunny died and I buried it in my backyard and then I turned it over and I saw a knife in its back and I told the police that it was a murder. Whoa, slow down. When you're talking about a deep, serious story, then you need pauses, man. They need to feel all the emotions. Let's try that again. My bunny died. And I buried it in my backyard. But then I turned it over and I saw a knife in its back. So I called the police to tell them that it was a murder. Pauses make a big difference. They allow the emotions to be felt in your audience and that they can make it relatable. When it comes to humor, pauses are very, very critical. For example, in order for me to get married to my Indian wife, I had to get the approval of her father. Papa, I, I, can I marry your daughter? He just stood there like this. <laughs> Of course you can. Come here. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> if I didn't pause, then the humor just wouldn't come because that's where they're supposed to laugh. Did you also notice I gave an element of surprise there? The last thing is word repetitions. Now, in order to have your audience remember your speech as easily as possible, you need to have certain catchphrases you say throughout your speech. The best example is in college speech. Do you remember in his speech, he would always say different variations of Kali, and he would repeat them all the time throughout his speech. It made it easily remembered, and that's why he won. But the bad part was that many months after his speech, whenever somebody saw him, everybody would greet him with Khalid. It annoyed him tremendously, but that's what got him to a winning speech in the entire Middle East. Politicians Barack Obama and Donald Trump use catchphrases all the time. 
Do you remember what they were? Yes, we can. America first. Now, just about all the people may have forgotten what their policies were, but I would say a big reason they became presidents is because they used catchphrases very effectively. A great way to have repetitions is saying it at the beginning of your speech and then saying it later on in the body. For example, if I want to give a speech about putting my ego away whenever I'm having an argument with people and I want to teach people how to do that, then I could use the catchphrase, the customer is always right. In the beginning of my speech, I could portray an argument I had with my wife and I say, okay, you are right. Then I look to the audience and I say, the customer is always right. But then I say in the body of my speech that I had an argument with my coworker and then she would always do everything she could to try to get me fired in any way possible. And I was burning on the inside, but then I say to her, I'm sorry, you're right. And then I look to the audience, the customer is always right. But because I would do that all the time with my coworker, she ended up saying good things about me and I got a promotion. And then that catchphrase, the customer is always right, would be in the minds of my audience as they exit the room and it would help reinforce my overall message and my point of my entire speech to them. That's the simplest and fastest way to get them to remember my speech. At this time, I want you to go back into your speech. Here's your exercise. Pause the video now and get it done. Well, we're just about done, but not yet. At this time, I want you to go back into your end result that you wrote at the very beginning and re-edit it or modify it in whatever way you feel after learning all of my tips. I want you to think as big as you can. For example, the reason I want to constantly improve myself as a speaker is to get hired by companies to speak at their events or presentations or be an MC. But that's my goal. Your goal could be to get a promotion at the company or to build your self-esteem, or to improve your overall atmosphere in your company, whatever it could be. At this time, finalize your overall end result of why you actually want to be a better speaker. When you know exactly why you're doing all of this, then you'll be way more motivated to apply the tips that I've given you to make yourself a better speaker. My purpose in my life and for making this video is to make sure that you're the best speaker that you can possibly be. But how can I help you if you can't help yourself? Pause the video now and finalize your end result. Well, that's a wrap of everything I taught you about public speaking. Remember, the more you practice, the better you are. And always remember to apply the tips that I've given you so that you can be the greatest speaker that you can be. And don't forget to keep your end result in mind whenever you're writing a speech. That way, you're always going to be motivated. Your last requirement is to use the link that I'm about to show you, print it off, write your name, and put the certificate in a frame. Thank you so much for listening to me, and I really hope that you become the greatest speaker that you can be.